Hello and welcome to season two of The Internationalist. My name is David Adler and I'm the general coordinator of the Progressive International. And I'm joined this week as I will be joined every week of this second season by my colleague on the PI Secretariat, Varsha Gandhikota Nidlatla. Hi, Varsha. Hi, David, and hi, everyone. I'm calling in from Bangalore and in India. This time last year, we launched our show, The Internationalist, with the aim of bringing you news from the front lines of struggles around the world, connecting us across territories and oceans, across nations and generations, and thinking together about how we can build the international solidarity that will be necessary to get organized, to fight, and to win against the forces of reaction that are organized against us. That inaugural season consisted of over a dozen episodes with activists, with authors, with academics from all over the world who are getting organized to confront some of the most dangerous global threats and show us what it means to make solidarity more than a slogan on issues such as vaccine apartheid to the Indian farmer strike, a discussion that was led by my co-host here, Varsha. So today we inaugurate the second season of The Internationalist. Welcome. Over the next 10 weeks, every Friday at 12 p.m. Mexico City time, 7 p.m. Berlin, 10.30 p.m. New Delhi, we will run an episode of this show, The Internationalist, hosted for you this season by David and me. Each week, we hope to bring you updates from the Progressive International Secretariat, what we've been up to, but also news and analysis that's of interest to internationalists across the globe. And every week, our segment, David and mine, will be followed by a longer one, an interview with a special guest focusing on a range of issues from the illegal occupations in Palestine to neo-authoritarian maneuvers in my country, India, where I am, or Brazil, where David just was over the summer, to issues like the new pink tide in South America. Before we pass to today's special guest, though, David, should we share a bit about what we've been up to at the PI Secretariat this summer? Sure. So I'm just returning from our incredible delegation to Brazil uh, this August. Over the course of 10 days, we convened parliamentarians, um, activists, social movement leaders, and indigenous representatives from across the Americas to join frontline communities in Brazil and progressive forces across the country in their efforts to stop Jair Bolsonaro's assault on the Amazon, on its peoples, and on Brazilian democracy itself. So it was quite an expansive delegation. Uh, we met with, you know, as I mentioned, these indigenous leaders from the articulation of indigenous peoples of Brazil, the APIB. We met with Quilambola and originary communities organized in the Konaki. We met with members of Congress from parties like the PT, the PSOL, the PSEB, the PSEDUB, uh, to listen to their struggle in Congress against the great forces of the right that have been long been powerful in Brazil and, and, and under Bolsonaro have become even more emboldened to pursue a kind of extractive and authoritarian agenda. And we met with trade unions and social movements such as the Landless Workers Movement, the MST, the, housing, the Homeless Workers Movement, forgive me, the MTST, as well as the largest trade union in, in Latin America, the CUT. And we joined them as they launched a massive general strike against Jair Bolsonaro's assault on public services in the country. So a full scale of the kind of resistance organized against President Bolsonaro. And the delegation concluded with the so-called Luta Pela Vida, the struggle for life, the largest indigenous mobilization in the history of Brazil, as Indigenous nations from across the country traveled to the capital, Brasilia, to occupy the center of the capital and demand a very simple <laughs> statement that Indigenous lives matter and they're not going to let Jair Bolsonaro continue with his efforts to enable land grabbers and agribusiness interests to evict, to invade, to steal, and to deforest Indigenous lands in the Amazon rainforest. It was a very, very powerful experience, I think, for all the delegates who were convened there, and hopefully for many of you who are paying attention to our travels over the course of the delegation. But again, the goal of these delegations is not to fact find. It's not just to 
you know, shake hands and meet people. Of course, that exchange of interpersonal solidarities is really critical to building the kind of international front that we're engaged in. But also critical is to have proposals that can take forward the lessons of that delegation. And like I said, you know, make solidarity more than a slogan, try to actually put something on the table for how we can engage in mutual and coordinated action on many of the agenda items that are so critical in this context. So to that end, there were three main proposals that came out of this delegation, which I think might be of interest to the internationalist viewers. The first is to build a global campaign to expose, divest, and boycott the multinational corporations that are deeply implicated in the theft and destruction of indigenous Quilombola and originary lands across the country. So that campaign will focus on targets like Cargill, which are equally complicit in that dispossession in Brazil as they are in North America, based as they are in Minnesota, as well as financiers like Blackstone that profit from and take advantage of Bolsonaro's war on indigenous communities and the Amazon rainforest. The second, which hopefully we'll have uh, an update on quite soon later in this internationalist season, is to demand answers from what the CIA and its director, William J. Burns, were doing in Brazil earlier this summer when they traveled down to meet with Jair Bolsonaro. Of course, that line of inquiry follows on in the long shadow of the CIA's role in Lava Jato, the corruption scandal that saw the ousting of President Dilma Rousseff uh, and later the arrival to power of the so-called Trump of the tropics, Jair Bolsonaro. So we're trying to get some answers of what exactly they spoke about, answers that neither the CIA nor the Bolsonaro government have discussed beyond Bolsonaro's brief statements that they discussed how to keep the left out of power in Latin America now that, quote, Evo Morales' gang has made their way back to the presidency in, Bol uh, in Bolivia. And the third, critically very important to the activities of the PI in the past year, is to mobilize an international delegation to observe Brazil's historic presidential elections next year, following attempts by the president and his various reactionary allies in Congress to pass a raft of reforms to change the way that people vote, how those votes are counted, how parties collect money, how parties spend money, uh, and who regulates and investigates the electoral process, all of which is just ringing the alarm about efforts to undermine a democratic process and at most kind of advance a, a coup type agenda, an auto coup type agenda to maintain Jair Bolsonaro's power in the presidency despite his rapidly declining popularity. So plenty of work in Brazil and hopefully more updates soon on that stuff. What about you, Varsha? What have you been up to? As your delegation took on this attack on democracy in Brazil, David, I was working with a different delegation taking on another wretched crisis, that of the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, you know, an attack really on the right to life, the right to health. And we find ourselves in this remarkable historical moment. We already have the medical technology, we have the financial resources and the productive potential to eradicate COVID-19 really once and for all. But for the majority of the world's population, the end of the pandemic is nowhere in sight. And this happens, right, as the UK and the US are buying booster shots, even as the entire continent of Africa, less than 2% of its entire population has been vaccinated. So this June at PI, as many of our viewers would have known, we organized the inaugural summit for vaccine internationalism, convening over 20 governments, pharmaceutical manufacturers, public health advocates, and really leaders from political leaders from around the world to make concrete commitments, asking ourselves the question, how can we accelerate vaccine redistribution, vaccine production, and really end the pandemic? And there, something extraordinary happened. At the PI Summit for Vaccine Internationalism, countries came together to work in solidarity and made critical, tangible commitments. So three of which I think would be of interest for our viewers today on the Internationalist episode. Cuba, a small island nation fighting, as you well know, a six decade long economic blockade by the United States, pledged to openly license its vaccine technologies and at solidarity prices in a first. No other country, no other company has done this before. So it's really a remarkable achievement. And then Mexico and Argentina committed to pool manufacturing capacity to ramp up production. We know that there are many countries who aren't able to produce vaccines for themselves. And so this offer to continue to do so well after their own people and their own populations have been vaccinated was once again, just incredibly hopeful to listen to. And then the third commitment from countries like Venezuela, from Bolivia, who call for a new block to be formed to challenge the big pharma monopoly and through many different actions, one of which is an act of collective disobedience. So from the summit emerged what we're now calling the Union for Vaccine Internationalism. 
we in the room then when the summit was happening and certainly at you know the pi secretariat take inspiration from movements like the non aligned movement and there was a call for a new international health order so this call really echoes proposals from put forward in the 1970s in the un when to challenge imperialism to challenge a certain kind of economic dependency of the global south on the global north there was a call for a new international economic order so i for one certainly could not be more excited to witness this new block emerging from the global south and see how they're going to wrestle power away from the rich countries of the world and place public health really front and center of this pandemic response once again and today's episode is special for me for this reason because it's also about anti imperialism it's centered around the 20th anniversary of the 911 of the 10th anniversary of the occupy wall street protests and the war in afghanistan david who do we have today for, on for today's international episode so today's guest is i think one of the greatest musicians alive a tireless internationalist who has been involved in key struggles around the world for years. Uh and he's also a member of our Progressive International Council. Tom Morello has been producing music raging against the machine uh since that band's first record was released in 1992. Here's a clip of Tom speaking at Occupy Wall Street in 2011. I'm a supporter of Occupy Wall Street and all and the other 1300 occupy movements across the country and across the world right now because it is overdue that the 99% of the population that does not own and control the planet stands up for their rights. Do do people have control over what their lives and their world are like beyond voting once every 4 years for someone they cross their fingers and hope is going to do the best job? It's not a choice between the lesser of two evils, it's often the choice of the evil of two lessers. And while there was some hope, you know, at the beginning of the Obama campaign that this would be a different presidency, everybody like the blinders are off. you know the blinders are off like this is we're we're on our own and that's the thing that's i think the strength of occupy wall street is that we've got to figure this out ourselves and we're not going to wait for them and they're dissatisfied and they're not serviced by the mainstream political parties and they're not serviced by the you know the the hate mongering of the right wing populist movements and this is a place where in your hometown tomorrow you're in high school you can start occupy libertyville illinois it's a place where people can gather to express their grievances and to express their solidarity with one another like we feel like it, shit ain't right and we're going to do something about it not sure exactly what that's going to be but we've got a place to go to stand together right. the media doesn't make a revolution the media didn't report on it until somebody got pepper sprayed then the media didn't report on it nationally until 700 people got arrested you know it was happening but the media wasn't reporting on it and now you know the guy from rage against the machines performing so the media is reporting on that now too but I mean, it's happening whether or not any of those things are occurring i mean you know as as gandhi said first they ignore you then they laugh at you then they fight you and then you win a dear comrade stachko horvat was a philosopher pi council member dr tom morello about imperialism the importance of internationalism and the power of music julian assange and as i gather star trek but before i hand over to stachko and tom i do have one ask If you like this show, subscribe to the Progressive International YouTube channel. Please turn on the notification so you know when our next episode is, when we publish any other content that we're so keen to bring to you. And now, finally, over to you, Stretchko, for internationalism against the machine. It's my great pleasure to welcome one of the greatest guitarists of all time, a committed internationalist, and I'm proud to say. a council member of the progressive international uh hi tom how are you where are you and i'm well up? i'm 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 at home in los angeles so hello mm-hmm. it's nice to be here and i i appreciate uh it, i'm i'm honored to be a member of the council Yeah, we are honored also to have you together with Noam Chomsky, Jeremy Corbyn, Naomi Klein, Yanis Varoufakis, and many others. Uh, through this uh, podcast, we will also uh, inform the, our supporters and possible future supporters and members about the activities of the Progressive International. Uh, but let me start with my first question, uh, which comes back to the first time that uh, I got in touch with you. uh you probably won't remember it uh, because you don't know it it was 30 years ago uh so rage against the machine was formed in 1991 uh i was a kid uh, living in croatia uh, socialist yugoslavia was collapsing uh we were living through a bloody war and i remember during those years at the beginning of the 90s 
um, a cousin came from Germany, a cousin of mine, and he came with a record and on the cover was a self-immolating monk. Well, I was like nine or 10 years old, so I didn't have a clue who the monk was, but as soon as I heard Bomb Track, uh, Killing in the Name, uh, Bullet in Your Head and other songs, uh, it hit me as a kid. Later then I went also to start playing punk and hardcore uh, and actually Rage Against the Machine and your music really helped me both to learn English through the lyrics, uh, but also to politicize uh, in, in, in a situation where my generation uh, was during the war either scared or had a lot of rage against the machine, which we still didn't understand. Uh, so that was 30 years ago. Um, in the meantime, uh, uh, there, you, you've been continuing not only with Rage Against the Machine, you've been a vocal activist on various issues, fighting for justice against inequality, against racism, imperialism. And in the meantime, it seems as if, okay, on the one hand, there has been a lot of rage since then. I mean, from Seattle, Genoa, Occupy Wall Street, so-called Dara Spring and so on. But what we can witness in the last years is also that uh, the rage was used, channeled by populism, now with the pandemic, by various conspiracy theories, uh, you know, uh, hating others, uh, uh, this kind of scare and fear in society. Uh, which is actually not uh, uh, productive, it is counterproductive. So my question is, how can we use rage, which is obviously a very important feeling of uh, uh, the oppressed ones, uh, in a constructive way? How can we use it and how can we steal it from the populists who are really successfully using it today? Yeah, I, I think you've identified a, a very important crossroads that we've been at and how the, um, the, sent the popular sentiments of wanting better lives for ourselves have been co-opted in some ways by these right-wing demagogues across the across the globe. And I think that has to do recognizing the underlying conditions, I think is very important. And my belief is that it has to do exclusively with the failures of neoliberalism and capitalism to serve the needs of the majority of like working class people on, on the planet. Um, and while like I can only speak to specifically the uh, uh, instances in my country where there was a tremendous amount of both during the Clinton administration and the Obama administration, which, you know, sort of talk the talk in the way of kind of being for for the people at the end of the day, a lot of that Trump rhetoric of sort of coastal elites, this, that, and the other was, was true. And at the end of the day, those who were enriched most, those who bought houses in the Hamptons and new yachts were the Wall Street elite and the oligarchical forces, not just in the United States, but across the world who benefited from the neoliberal policies of both right and center in the United mm -hmm. States. I come from a small town in Illinois, which was directly impacted by these policies. When I was growing up, it was a it was a union town, a liberal town. It was all all white kind of coal mining town, but there was a thought of like community and solidarity and and you know sort of a, a general sense of 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 picking each other up. During this then then there felt like there was an abandonment by both both of the, U, the US parties. And I saw this happening when I was on tour. You'd see it in Germany, you'd see it in Brazil. And like the parties that sort of were supposed to be representing the people also were playing into this neoliberal the, the, capitalist global scheme to enrich the very, very few. That made for a very fertile groundwork for these right-wing demagogues to use the oldest tricks in the book, racism and divide and conquer. No, it's not the part of it's not the fault of Wall Street, it's the fault of Muslims. No, it's not the fault of this, you know, the system that you've been you've been falsely laboring under. It's the fault of immigrants. And they have and they've been grifting, they've been grifting the working class across the globe over the course of these last last 10 years or so. Now, the question is, how do we literally take take the power back? And how do we change change that narrative? I think the first thing is to is to make is to help people realize that they are agents of history and that they are not on the sideline where to be led by some. Uh, uh, demagogic figure that, that when there has been progressive radical or even revolutionary change for the better in the lives of work of, of poor people and working people, it has been generated by from below, not from above. And so just merely looking at historical examples, you know, from, I mean, from the Berlin Wall to apartheid to women getting the right to vote, civil rights movement in the United States, so the, if there's been a one common thread throughout my 30 years of, of art and music across 21 albums, it's that the world is not going to change itself. That's up to you, literally up to you, the people listening right now. And the, 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 that, while that may sound daunting and intimidating, 
the good news is that when the world has changed for the better, it was changed by people no different from yourselves, who didn't have any more power, courage, money, influence, creativity, or intelligence than anyone listening right now. It's a matter of simply standing up for what you believe, standing up for a more decent, just, and humane planet in your time and place, in your place of work, in your school, uh, in your country. Yeah, thanks for this message. I think it's very important, especially for those people uh, who are stuck to the screens. They're using the screens during the pandemic uh, in order to fight the system. Uh, you've been uh, for, throughout all your life and, and activities from music to political activism, you've been very vocal uh, and supportive of various struggles in the world. I mean, from, from it's not just in the US or criticizing US foreign policy, but from the very beginning, you supported the Zapatista movement, uh, you supported struggles in Brazil, in Chile, in Palestine, most recently in Cuba. Uh, so my question is, uh, from the perspective of the Progressive International and what we are trying to do together, uh, what does internationalism mean to you? And yeah. uh, what do you think, in which way can internationalism kind of revive itself, uh, 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 reinvent itself in the 21st century? What kind of yeah. internationalism do we need today? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that first, first of all, sort of recognizing that we are one human family on one globe is key. Like when you look at planet Earth from above, there are no borders that can be seen. You know what I mean? There's no, um, and, and that that's something that I recognize. I grew up in an internationalist household. Um, my, my father's side of the family were anti-colonialists in Kenya. My, mother, my white American mother was very much involved in sort of civil rights movements and was a, a foreign student advisor at the University of Illinois. So she had this like, there was this kind of pool of global ideas that were in my home. And importantly, it stood in very stark contrast to the community that I grew up in, which was arch, which was racially homo homogenous, archly conservative. And so when, when like the ideas of my household of like, it's important to always stand up for the people on the lowest rung of the ladder. If I have, if my problems here are related to the problems of a sweatshop worker in China. Like we're all in this together. That was something that was a very much like baked into my DNA as a, as, as a young person. Then as a traveling musician, you like over the course of the last three decades, I've seen just the reality of the, of the commonality of, of, of humankind and how it's the, the struggles of working class and poor people everywhere anywhere are the struggles of working class and poor, poor people everywhere. Now what I've like, I didn't choose to be a guitar player. That chose me. I'm kind of stuck, blessed and cursed to be a guitar player. So, so how I've looked at it is the, is not never distancing my, my beliefs and my world outlook from my vocation. Mm -hmm. And I think that a starting point for anyone doing any job or any student anywhere is don't leave behind who you are in what you do and keep it taking off the blinders to this sort of like provincialism and, and nationalism and realizing that that a student in Argentina and a student in Chicago and a student in Beijing may have the similar outlook. And one of the one of the things that I think that, that music is an incredible ambassador for that is that it really, it, I mean, I can speak from personal experience, it is a global language. And so, and, and a, a song of, of resistance or a song of solidarity translates across borders in a way that can be very impactful. Yeah, that's precisely what I also wanted to talk to you about. It is uh, the power of music, the, the relation between music and revolution, music and resistance. Uh, uh, most recently, the protesters in Portland were singing, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Uh, and uh, not only there, but in various protests uh, around the world, your songs uh, have been there, you know, at the protests. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if you look at those protests, at least in Europe, I guess also in the world, you will very often hear uh, old songs. I mean, old revolutionary songs from the Spanish Civil War, Bella Ciao, uh, yeah. par partisan songs from the resistance movement in Yugoslavia even. Uh, uh, and my question is, uh, do we, I mean, of course, uh, 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 Killing in the name of is an example that we also have new protest songs, uh, but maybe not so many. You know, how do you see it? Because usually at the protest, we will also always hear the old songs, which is of yes. course, but it's of course important because yes. of continuity of yes. uh, uh, internationalism and so on. But where are the new songs? Do we have this kind of new collective songs which are universal in, in the language, like Bella Ciao, for instance? Exactly, exa exactly. I think that, that's an interesting question because, like, the way that I've looked at it, I mean, having gone to thousands of protests by now uh, that I was always like, you know, sort of as a young person who loved hip hop and who loved punk rock. And they were always singing these kind of like, 
you know, these kind of like pleasant folk songs from yes. the 60s that I kind of, I was like, yeah, I mean, yeah, but that, you know, yeah, maybe we need some new jams, man. <laughs> and and honestly, I thought, well, if if nobody else is going to write them, I'm going to have to write them myself with my friends, you know. Um, but the, but the, but there is a there is something that's very very important in the art form of music that 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 puts wind in the sails of of resistance movements. Mm -hmm. Music predates spoken and written written language, and there's something about sort of the gathering of the tribe and the right combination of 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 rhythm and and rhyme and performance that feels like truth in a way in our reptilian brains that no nothing else touches um and also you know like uh uh the great uh sort of poet laureate of the 20s early 20th century uh labor movement joe hill said like a pamphlet will be read, read one time but a song will be sung hundreds of times over and will be stuck in the heart forever and it's something you do together and that's a, that is a really important thing. I've you know I've seen it from from my own solo shows in front of, you know, hundreds of people to Rage Against the Machine shows in front of tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. and how music can can change people's minds, can forge solidarity, can put wind. I can't even tell you like the number of times when you know I've shown up on some some picket line, and just the fact that some a stranger, someone who is not in that union, someone who is not from that town who's not from that country shows up to play songs that we all gather around where English may not be a first language but they recognize that in those songs is the world that we're trying to create you know and I think that that is a very important moment uh, that can only be done with that particular art form mm -hmm. Yeah, the more. Sorry, I... so, yeah, and there are. Well, your, your, your question was, why are there not? Where are the protest songs of now? Well, here's the thing: is like the protest song, they're there, but there's not. Rage Against the Machine is an anomaly in that it was a a a a a, a band with extremely radical left politics that managed to sell tens of millions of records. That is a a unique a unique phenomenon. Those songs exist. Those songs are being written, but those songs are not go going through the capitalist funnel in the way that Rage Against the Machine did to be able to promote those songs from, you know, Peoria to Pakistan. And so that's I think that's just something to keep in mind. And in some ways the 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 net the communication network of solidarity songs was stronger in eras past. Than it, than it is now. And you may say that Rage Against the Machine may be, um, you know, certainly Public Enemy, The Clash, Rage Against the Machine, System of a Down may sort of be sort of the last major band with with politics on its sleeve in an un unapologetic way. And I think there's a couple of, there's, there's um, you know, on the one hand, the music has to be compelling and great for people to even care about what it's saying. And I think that's the case from Pete Seeger to you know, to system system of a down, but also to have that kind of, I guess now today, I mean, I don't, I'm not that familiar with all of the, you know, I'm not sure that there are viral political TikTok dancers or something who could, you know, might be able to, 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 to create the same sort of cascading event. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the same as we shall overcome and fuck you. I won't do what you tell me. Yep. Uh, I also want to focus a bit on, uh, on the, well, sad anniversary, uh, which is, coming, uh, which is the invasion of Afghanistan, the 20th anniversary of the inv invasion of Afghanistan. But also at the very right moment, we are in the middle of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, in the aftermath uh, of 9-11, uh, uh, you made a song uh, uh, which, which is called uh, No One Left, yes. uh, which kind of connected 9-11 and the invasion of Iraq. Uh, so my question is, uh, having in mind what is happening, the atrocities uh, in Afghanistan at this moment, of course, the mainstream liberal and neoliberal media will say the war is over, uh, although hundreds of thousands of people died in Afghanistan, more than 5 million people are displaced. Uh, yes. Here in Europe, uh, uh, we are already facing uh, another refugee crisis, which actually never ended, but now we are we are having it on the periphery of the European Union, you know, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, yes. Greece, Albania, Kosovo on that side, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is not the center of, of Europe. So my question is, I, I, I've seen that you have been uh, supporting the kids of Afghanistan. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, what can we as progressives do concretely about Afghanistan? Yeah. And uh, what actually changed? How do you think the war is finished as they're trying yeah. to convince us? And yeah. how can we stop the war machine? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, well, first of all, I mean, this will not come as a surprise to 
people on who are listening right now, yep. but sort of like identifying the roots and the causes of the war, I think are important to understand anything that happened in its aftermath. Yep. And this was not a, this was not a war to nation build and bring freedom to oppressed Afghan, you know, that it, it was, it was a war of imperialism and it was a war that, Amer you know, there's a lot of sort of ri uh, uh, crying and wringing of hands about how, you know, 20 years and we've lost the war. No, 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 no. The war was won. The war was won by the people who made trillions of dollars from this war, which was their intent to begin with. They didn't care, they didn't care at all about the women in Afghanistan or American veterans or anything like that. It's all part of the, It's all part of an endless war machine to enrich themselves and to get one more mansion in the Hamptons and one more yacht at the end of the day. So this war was very, very successful in the eyes of the people who the eyes of the people who waged it and those who sold those who sold them sold them the weapons. Um, what can we do concretely now? I mean, I've been involved um, in this in this organization. It's called the uh, Miraculous Love Kids, and it was you know basically there was this organization of street street kids, um, an American musician who sort of found the religion of love and went over there and you know pulled these kids, these orphans, you know these war or these little young girls off the street, uh, gave them education and and through music, use music as a rehabilitation tool. I was honored to make a song with them and been in touch with them. Um, you know, and as soon as the the Taliban takeover happened, they destroyed their school. The girls are now in hiding, having known, you know, to have played Western songs and been educated by a, you know, white American man, they're on a hit list. And, and so we've been trying unsuccessfully so far to get them out of the country and hopefully they can they can stay safe. But as far as what we can concretely do, I mean, here's the thing, like for, the first thing we can con concretely do is just, is recognize what happened. And there's such, at least in the United States, there's such obfuscation of of what really went on and what and why it went on. And and at the at the core of it, it is just another American power grab war of imperialism. And that that's if you understand that at its core, all the rest of it makes sense. Like the 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 the, the political composition of Afghanistan is not much different today than it was the day when the first you know, um, uh, American troop, troops went in. The only differences are, as you said, there's hundreds of thousands of dead, millions displaced, some uh, arms manufacturers are made wealthy, and some Af young Afghanistan girls are in hiding for their lives. Yep, someone who revealed uh, the, the, the war crimes in Afghanistan uh, is someone who is uh, still in prison uh, already for two years. Uh, his name is Julian Assange. Uh, you've been, besides Mumia Abu Jabal, of course, for years, who is 40 years in prison, unfortunately. Besides Chelsea Manning, you've been very supportive of Julian Assange. Uh, uh, I guess those who are uh, watching us now and listening to us uh, probably know the song you made together with Calais 13, a mm -hmm. great Puerto Rican hip hop band uh, where even uh, a quote from, from Julian appears. Uh, he's my friend, I met him several times at, at the embassy and we were listening to the song together at the embassy and he really loved it. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I think he would be happy to, to, to listen to us today, but unfortunately he's unable. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, we're in a moment uh, where very soon at the end of October, there will be another court hearing uh, uh, where the United States is requesting the extradition of Julian Assange from Belmarsh prison from the UK and mm -hmm. wants to imprison him for 175 years. Uh, so my question is, how do you comment, uh, comment it? Uh, uh, what can we do in order to, to, to help to release him? What yeah, kind of yeah. pressures do progressives yeah. have to build in the US itself towards Biden? Yeah. Uh, uh, and yeah. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, first of all, Julian Assange and, you know, and, and Ed, Edward Snowden are, are heroes. And the, the thing that they're being persecuted for is the truth. And what they've done is they've exposed that imperialist war machine for the horrific war crime generating thing that it is. So let's just say that for first and foremost, they've committed no crime other than pulling back the curtain and showing the real raw reality of what the United States has been up to, uh, you know, in the Middle East and 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 around the globe, you know, as far there's, I believe that there's there is a there's an interesting sort of overlap, um, you know, in the in the the kind of the libertarian strain, the kind of the right libertarian strain in the United States and and the Assange movement, because and I think that there may be some some uh, unusual room for you know reaching across the aisle you know with regards to Julian Assange who's seen as a as a truth telling hero not just entirely on the far left you know what i'm saying um as someone who's exposing the deep state and all you know th th there's a sort of conspiracy slant to it but as someone who like some of the other 
crazier conspiracists are like sort of again pulling out the scab off of the system that is you know ho holding us down so i as far as like concrete steps i mean I, 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 I've signed every petition and this, that, and the other. I don't know. I'm hopeful that the United States does not get his hands on them. Um, there's also, you know, there's uh, there was actually some talk, you know, at the end of the Trump administration that he might grant some sort of preordained pardon or something because he is he is a figure that is revered by some on on, on that end, end of the spectrum. All I can do, I mean, the way I look at it is like all I can do is continue to shed light on there's a price to be paid for telling the truth under this system. And Julian is saying just someone who is, paying, who is paying that price. So I think we just sort of recognize one, that sacrifice, two, act on the truth that he revealed and the world that, 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 he, laid, that he laid bare and then express our solidarity and support in whatever ways we can. Yeah, thanks a lot for this message. Uh, we at the Progressive International will also continue uh, uh, to support him. Actually, last year we launched something which is called the Belmarsh Tribunal, inspired by the Sartre Russell Tribunal, uh, where we want to actually shed light precisely on the US crimes which he revealed to change the narrative that he yes. is, you know, uh, uh, a criminal. Um, since well, we I are... would say, please, when you, when you, please send me that or whatever, like, because I'd be happy via sort of my, my channels and whatever you know, limited influence I have to to help in that regard. because I think that that's at least, I don't know that that's gonna get Julian Assange out of jail, but I do think that it is important to make his sacrifice more worthwhile by, you know, cause now, you know, time marches on and there's a new, there's a younger generation that doesn't really even understand what, who that guy is or why, or why he's in jail. So I think that like to, to, to whatever degree we can help broadcast, you know, the, the underlying message of uh, the, explain why this guy is a uh, political prisoner and why we should get him out of jail. Definitely. Uh, since we are kind of uh, running out of time, unfortunately, uh, let me pose a question which uh, will go from the dysto dystopian content that we shared today, unfortunately, wars, uh, uh, prisoners, political prisoners, and so on, to something which is more utopian. And that's, of course, Star Trek. Uh, uh, you're known as a Trekkie. Uh, uh, you even appeared uh, in some of the episodes, most notably in Voyager, the scene which I really liked because you were actually not playing, you were really happy to be there. Uh, yes. so, so, so my question is, uh, what can progressives and the left, uh, but also the right, learn from stuff? You know? yeah, yeah. yeah, one of the things that I think that the, the, to step back for a second is that's important in, this is a way of like, like putting your ideas and your convictions in your vocation, which Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek did. You know, like he did not shy away from aiming for the world he would like to one day really see without compromise by just sort of presenting this vision of, you know, at the time, at the height of the Cold War, there was a Russian and an American. There was a, the first interracial kiss on American television was on the show Star Trek, you know, sort of presenting a, a, a possible future where, where economic want and where sort of material gain are things of, things of the, the desire for material gain are things, things of the past. So I think that like, but in some ways, you know, like if you build it, they will come. And so I think it's, it is important in our, in our lives and in our music and whatever it is that we do to not just rail against the injustices of the day, but to present the future that we really want without compromise, not just like, oh, maybe we can get this Supreme Court justice who isn't quite as horrible as that Supreme Court justice, but to really like hold up, like this is what it could look like. This is, you know, rather than, three more aircraft characters, no more homelessness. That's a, that's a financial calculation right there. You know what I'm saying? Like, what is the world that we really want and how? And then let's begin crafting a path towards it, not just constantly being on our heels on the defensive, stopping one trauma and one tragedy after another, but to have in mind and begin building in small ways. What I always, at every show I play, I try in that space to create a little bit of the world I'd like to one day see. That's what I try to do in my job in your, your job as a journalist or your work as a, a student or a carpenter or a plumber, whatever it is, is try to have, you know, to try not to suppress that optimistic inner voice that believe, because here's the thing, like th there throughout history, there have been seemingly insurmountable odds of horrible, like from slavery to the divine right of kings to whatever that seemed like they were absolutely immovable and that there would never not be a, surf class or you know or the middle passage and in, in slavery and those things changed and they didn't change by divine acts and they didn't change because there was the right president office they changed because of people no different from listening to this right now 
the end. That's it. That's how the world changes. You change it. You do it. So Thanks. start doing it. <laughs> start doing it, goddamn. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Not you, I mean. Everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, me yeah, too. But... I mean, like, I'm like, me too. Start doing it. Yeah, but I really love what you said, because I know that you described yourself once as the only anarchist in a conservative uh, uh, school. I also started with anarchism. Actually, rage also kind of helped me to go into anarchism. Uh, and I think we have to combine these both positions. I, know, I don't know whether everyone will agree with me uh, who is watching now, but I think on the one hand to have this utopian perspective, a mm -hmm. concrete vision, uh, which maybe China is having, we, we might not like it, but they have a 20 years 20 years plan, you know, what to do in the next 20 years and politics yeah. in the US or Europe is usually, you know, just changing parties, four yes, years, yes. political yes. cycles and so on. But on the other hand, I think what you are showing in your work is that we need also this kind of anarchist perspective, uh, mutual aid, uh, concrete uh, utopias or heterotopias mm -hmm. or temporary autonomous zones, uh, which we, where we here in the now, we are constructing mm -hmm. the society instead of just you know, dreaming uh, about exactly. the day when it will come. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, what does it look like? I mean, during the height of the Occupy movement, like I played in maybe three dozen Occupy encampments around the world. I'm, like we'd finish a show in, you know, Scotland and then drive over to the, wherever that, you know, and, and just sort of like, like, let's try, like, wh why, why, why don't we try tonight to make it? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like right here, right now. And that's something that you can do you know, in whatever your circumstance, you can just uh, try to try, not just imagine, but try to manifest the world that you'd like to one day see. Yeah, one last question, since we are so, uh, talking about playing, uh, I cannot not pose the question. Uh, you have a new album coming out in October, yes. the Atlas Underground Fire. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a song released already, which I quite liked, the Pantogram. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and it's, it's really cool because you went into this electric, uh, uh, electric rock sort of uh, uh, genre. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But my question is also, Rage Against the Machine announced a tour just before yeah. the pandemic, and it was supposed to happen in 2020 in spring. Now it is announced for the next year. Uh, well, the pandemic is kind of, we're still in the middle of it. What are your hopes? Uh, well, I mean, I, I hope that there are live shows, you know, like I haven't, but we've still been, I, I you know, at my home here is my 97 year old mom and my 90 year old mother-in-law. So we've like, like, we've been very, very safe. And I want, and I can't wait to return to, you know, to live, to one going to live, selfishly going to live performances, but also performing live. This has, of course, been the longest period of my life where I haven't played live live shows. And to return to like the joy and the celebration of resistance that happens um, in a way that feels safe, where you're playing a show and not in the back of your mind going, I hope one of those people in the audience doesn't go home and kill their grandma because of, of my show tonight. You know what I mean? So like, that's a, that's a, that's a real you know, that has been, that has been a roadblock. And so we have, we rebooked the Rage Against Machine United States tour for 2022. Fingers crossed that that's going to happen with, you know, Coachella and all that. Um, and I do, and in the meantime, one of the, while this, while this has been a time of, of great sort of anxiety and, you know, medical fear, um, it has also been the most prolific kind of writing and recording time of my career. You know, I put out two EPs already during this time, a, a, a handful of singles with, with other artists and have a record coming out called The Atlas Underground Fire, which is a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a I made this record entirely alone in my studio, but it's a collaborative record with artists around the globe, you know, from Bring Me the Horizon, who were in, who were in um, uh, Brazil, in the UK, to Refused in Sweden, to Sama Abdulhadi, who's a great, young Palestinian DJ um, to Bruce Springsteen in New Jersey. Uh, and so it was a way, you know, to, to continue to be active both musically and politically while isolated. Yeah, I must say, I can't wait because I've also been a big fan of Refused uh, and yeah. new, new Noise and, and the oh, other songs. We've got, dude, you're gonna, we've got a jam. You're gonna lose your mind. We've got it like- oh, I can't right. wait. It's, I can't it's exactly, wait. It's exactly what I hope for, you know, in a combination of like my guitar playing and his, lyrical vision and vocal it's a jam and bloody beetroots produced that song too it's like it's a jam it's a amazing jam. i can't wait this yeah. is great news uh and well i could talk for hours with you and um, uh, i guess we will continue thanks again for supporting the progressive international and being part of it and well i hope our paths will cross very soon and we will yes i hope together. i hope so too please if we're ever in the same you know within the same proximity please reach out i'd love to uh you know to, to meet in person and thanks and solidarity to everybody everybody watching and listening Thanks a lot. See you. Thank you. Peace. Cheers.